Of course, it's part of this much larger Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so as part of our, our design process, because we were challenged and we were part of a large team of engineers and architects to begin to study the Ohio Creek watershed and how basically to prioritize investment, right? So I'm sure all the policy and city managers know there's a bucket of money and you need to be able to understand how to best utilize that money for maximum effect. So that was really our charge. So we began by studying people and who is already doing this amazing work that's there. Almost like a survey of education, restoration, and innovation. Um, built that's, so our, the goal would be that our physical intervention would actually empower all this, these community organizations to do their work. We began to study our study area um, uh, and overlay census tracts and watersheds. And of course, those things never align, right? There's always a challenge. And we began to work with our engineering partners and architectural partners on a basic coastal defense strategy for the entire uh, um, segment. And that involves, in some cases, raising shorelines, raising edges. And this is the zone here of the park that I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail. Um, but so, you know, we have, um, we have began to prioritize coastal defense. But of course, the future is not just that the water in the coastal area is rising, as we saw in our in the um, uh, breakout session in the New Orleans and Houston group. We also have more and more extreme rain events. So a lot of the design of future landscapes, I think, is going to be modulating in between these two uh, forms of uncertainty. And this is what literally our park is doing. Um, so. So you can't just build a barrier, right? Because otherwise there's this massive system of pumps that needs to uh, be activated. So, so a couple more slides about um, coastal flood risk, risk and design, storm inundation. And you can really see, um, in this case, the 500-year flood, which also probably many of you are, are experiencing, is the, now the new 100-year flood line, is quite extreme and is really um, threatening this entire neighborhood. Um, so, um, and here it is with 30 inches of sea level rise, which is the rapid ice melt situation. <coughs> Fairly dire. Um, and the depth of flooding. And of course, as designers, this is incredibly um, important, right? Because when you talk about a wall or trying to keep water out, you're also blocking somebody's view of the water, which is that exact risk factor, right? So as designers, we're trying to take this information and incorporate it into the perspective of a person, right? So when we discovered that along this particular um, alignment, that um, this sort of uh, line of protection could be below people's eye lines. So we began to advocate for this particular route. And you can see the berm snaking through the park right here. And over time, you know, I mentioned this kind of concept of the coastal squeeze. Um, we have filled in our wetlands. We have um, placed schools, houses, uh, communities in places that were formerly tidal. And so uh, over the past, we've begun to fill in, as you can see here, and build in these spaces. But now, of course, as sea level is rising, um, these tidal shoreline streams and wetlands, water will find a way. And so we are now, um, in 2016, 2018, 2020, uh, looking at a kind of an inverse of, of history where these tidal uh, 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 traceways will be uh, reasserting themselves. So a big thing that we tried to do as we developed this park, which is here, is to try to understand these landscape typologies and edge typologies and how to kind of combine them together to integrate um, into a coastal protection system, but that also was living and live and that enabled this um, uh, uh, wetland uh, marsh system to migrate inwards as sea level is rising. So we identified this park in the larger project and it sort of sits between two very different neighborhoods. This is Grandy, Grandy Village, which is like a two-story um, uh, 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 publicly funded housing and then um, uh, and the opposite uh, side here, which is uh, mostly single family homes. So the park in here, it's a better, a better view of, of Chesterfield and Grandy Village. You can see that, of course, the landscape is the residual space, the sort of leftover space. So our goal is, rather than having this be a barrier between these two communities, how can, and, and this residual space, how can we use design to transform it into a positive park? Um, here's some images of the site. You can see the flooding um, uh, that's sort of 
characterizes the everyday, some of the sort of uh, housing fabric in the environs. And we started this project with this kind of radical listening. And this is our strategy of commun community engagement. We met with and talked with a whole range of different agencies, nonprofits, and residents to try to understand what are the priorities for this park. We had um, an exam a, a sort of a, almost like a game board type of model, which was um, in, in inspiring, trying to inspire people to um, program and activate the park and how to picture the kinds of parks and the kinds of activities that they wanted to see there. And we really interpreted that into um, uh, this kind of concept of play, learn, and relax, um, which then helped to drive uh, the programming and the physical design of the park. So I think that another key aspect of, I mentioned of, of landscape architecture is kind of mediating between environmental and social uh, contexts. And so we really began to spatialize that because in addition to visualizing, we can spatialize these concepts. And literally, uh, landscape architecture has a plan and a section. It has a defined um, uh, form. And so we can sort of uh, integrate these forms and sort of give a, a physical spatial voice to, to what we heard. So we developed this park that protects, connects, and engages, that enables um, the, the salt marsh to migrate inland, but then raises and creates a new kind of platform uh, where people can rec recreate. So um, um, another aspect, you know, I mentioned living breakwaters being inspired by the historic oyster beds. To, to develop this kind of concept, we were inspired by the hummock form of landscape, which is a natural form of, of land in this, in, in this area. Um, and it's really created by these um, uh, loblolly pines that literally hold soil and grow. So this is our kind of landscape form, and here you can see a hummock in real space, about how, what is a, a form that you find in this ecosystem that can help modulate between high ground and low ground. So we began to program and integrate hummocks, you can see here, into this uh, space where water can migrate and develop a, a rich three-dimensional um, uh, habitat. Um, and then you can see here the alignment of the berm and how we snaked it around the central field, which is now raised um, so that kids can play and that serves the adjacent school, Chesterfield Academy. And we began to integrate all of these um, needs together into one synthetic vision. Here you can see the hummocks uh, in, the, in the plan and how this high ground and low ground and uh, is, that's, I think, going to be the future of how we need to think about design uh, plays out and is programmed. Uh, you can see how the tidal uh, inlet is able to infiltrate and create a much richer uh, wetland ecosystem and how uh, the drain and the, the berm itself is protecting uh, the surrounding neighborhood. We looked to native plant communities for um, inspiration um, and, and a sort of a, a, a broad front evergreen uh, planting to really emphasize these uh, hummocks. Um, and moreover, began to understand how the sort of system of circulation could begin to loop together these two neighborhoods that were separated. And that would, that's at the much broader kind of city scale. And here you can see at the park scale how um, the bike connections and the berm path actually is not just a barrier, but it creates a new form of pathway. Within the park itself, we added a lot of detail um, relative to community terraces, um, which, were, which was a direct um, uh, uh, request uh, for this kind of space to relax, like an outdoor living room, um, places that um, people could just informally gather or play a game. We integrated uh, a hillside playscape adjacent to the school um, to create places for kids to play. And we also um, emphasized this notion of a wild wetland walk, because very much these communities are not accessing the, uh, the, the sort of beautiful uh, Ohio, Ohio Creek uh, uh, landscape. And so by bringing this sort of much richer, <laughs> thickly textured ecosystem inside, um, we can make this accessible to many people. And then finally, the central field was a key um, uh, request for the adjacent school. So it's a broad, uh, open, grassy lawn um, that can be used as a very flexible space, but it's lifted up above the flood level. And you can see how we've integrated sort of seating 
on the berm that's sort of protecting uh, that lawn. So it's this multi-purpose space that enables a kind of a whole new set of community interactions to happen. So that's my, my final um, image. And I just wanted to close by saying, you know, I've just shown you two, two projects really that speak to, I think, the potential of design and of landscape architecture to begin to try to pull together um, these very, very disparate um, and what very sometimes siloed uh, ways of thinking about the world. And it's really breaking down these silos that I think is a key to um, creating a resilient city. And um, so I'm very excited um, and to, to, to show you this work. And I'm also just thrilled to hear about all the amazing work that has been done already uh, in Atlanta to date. So with that, I will say thank you very much and on to a resilient city. Hi. What is the difference in a hummock and a hammock? <laughs> a softball question. Yes. <laughs> Do you like both hummocks and hammocks? <laughs> no, and, and I think it's funny, I mentioned the word hummock in a funny way because I, I didn't speak about our, our town branch 